Uh, yeah, so I guess I'm defending God. Uh, I don't I don't know if I feel entirely qualified, but uh, Charles Charles challenged me, and so here we go. Um, these these debates do sometimes get uncivil, so let me say. I don't have any problem who di with people who disagree with me. I don't dislike atheists. I don't think that they're evil or stupid or going to get tortured forever or anything like that. Um, and it would, be, it would be nice to settle the question definitively one way or the other uh, today. But I think, I think I would be pleased with just saying that that belief in God is a live option for people who are, are scientifically and, and philosophically literate and, and rational. Uh, so if, if you don't think that I can convince you of that, I'd be happy. Um, so now, why would we think something like this? Uh, it does seem that robust belief in God typically begins uh, subjectively with some sort of internal experience, and that seems that seems sensible in a way. I mean, if you thought of your mother primarily as a postulate to explain certain observations, that would be weird, right? Uh, and so a lot of people have had religious experiences, and a lot of people have sort of an intuitive grasp or apprehension that there's... Uh, despite the, the terrible things that happen in the world, there's uh, at the core a mind and, and purpose and love and goodness. Um, and it's not clear to me that we should just discount these uh, just willy-nilly. Uh, I mean, they, they might have these in similar ways to uh, the way that it just seems to us that uh, the external world exists and is not a figment of our imagination or that our epistemic norms are reliable or whatever. Uh, the idea that, that the only things we can believe are empirically publicly verifiable is itself not empirically publicly verifiable and therefore self-refuting. Uh, Duom tells us that scientists uh, making theory choices have to eventually fall back if they're going to extrapolate beyond just the bare data that they have on good sense. It seems like other people can then rely on good sense as well. Uh, and so it seems that we have a, a prima facie reason to give these people and people who trust them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, now, now sometimes, sometimes we do think these initial prima facie reasons are overridden by other concerns, right? So maybe that's what will happen, but, but just to start out with. Now, Charles, I guess, is going to tell us uh, that, that these should be overridden, and the reason for this is that belief in God is really, really improbable in our background evidence. And the reason that it's supposed to be really improbable, I guess, is that uh, Charles thinks philosophical materialism is a, a, a better explanation of all these. It coheres much better. Uh, with all of the all of the evidence that we have, and what is philosophical materialism? It's something like this: uh, that matter is the only thing that there is, and that all of our all true statements can be reduced to statements about whatever the fundamental physical particles are. So, like the table, uh, we talk about there being a table, but we could translate that into statements about pieces, and then translate that further into statements about molecules, and statements about protons and neutrons, and then statements about fermions and bosons and whatever whatever the, the, the fundamental physical particles are, and there wouldn't be any meaning lost. Um, and so Charles, I think, is going to argue that we can do that for everything. Um, and I'm going to disagree and argue that, that there are uh, pieces of evidence uh, which cohere much better with a theistic view than with that sort of view. Uh, so why, why, would, why would we think this? Well, the first reason would be the fact that our, our spatiotemporal reality exists at all. Uh, it seems entirely coherent to ask why. Uh, why, does these why do these things exist? Why do they behave the way that they do? And it doesn't seem that we're going to find any sort of answer to that question within physics or within uh, third-person observation. Because all of, all of the things that exist in spatiotemporal reality are contingent. They're things that could have not existed. Uh, they don't contain their own reason for existence. They depend on other things. And spatiotemporal reality itself is just a collection of all of these things. So if we're going to answer this sort of why question, we're going to have to postulate something that exists necessarily, something which contains its own reason to exist, doesn't depend on anything else, and couldn't have not existed. Uh, and nothing, nothing in our spatiotemporal reality seems to be like that. Uh, so this is an argument to a, a transcendent, necessarily existent ground of reality. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't depend on the universe having began at a certain point. Maybe it did, but... Uh, it, 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 it doesn't depend on that. The point isn't that an infinite amount of time at passing is impossible. The point is just that saying that wouldn't answer the existence question that's being posed. If I find uh, that there's a universe in my desk drawer, and I call it Bres Life, and I'm like, why is there a universe in my desk drawer? And they say, well, it's always been there. Like, that's not an answer to the question that I asked. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people uh, who are naturalists have found the conclusion of this line of thought unpalatable and have denied 
not just that we can know why things exist, but even that there is any explanation at all. Uh, that, that, that in principle there is any explanation. Uh, so Quentin Smith, who's a very famous uh, atheist philosopher, writes that uh, the most reasonable belief is that we came from nothing, by nothing, and for nothing. Uh, and I mean, I guess I you can't stop you from saying that, but it does, it does seem to be a legitimate question. And it does seem to be that if a view offers you an answer to a legitimate question that otherwise you would have to just sort of write off as unintelligible without clear reasons, then uh, I mean, it, it seems like that's a, a, a strike in favor of the view that, uh, that, gives, you, that gives you an answer. Uh, so if the universe depends on something outside of itself, that doesn't, that doesn't tell us very much, right? Maybe, maybe we can look at the ontological argument or at the, the arguments Thomas gives or something to give us, give us some of the, the attributes of this being. But another thing would be to, be to, to look at, uh, at the reality of which, which this being has, has apparently brought into being. Uh, one, one fact to consider is that uh, the, the universe it's generally agreed, as far as I understand, among physicists, at least seems to be fine-tuned for the existence of life, which is to say that if, if you're going to have any interesting embodied life, uh, a lot of things which would be really improbable just on chance have to occur. So uh, if gravity, holding the other relevant factors constant, if gravity were about one part and 10 to the 60th power, stronger or weaker, the universe either would have collapsed back in on itself or else would have expanded too fast for any stars to form. Uh, Roger Penrose says that the ratio of initial distributions of mass energy with low enough entropy to allow the development of life to life prohibiting ones is one part in 10 to the 10th power to the 123rd power, which is a number with 10 to the 53rd times as many zeros as there are particles in the universe. Um, and there are there are a number of there are a number of, depending on who you ask maybe like twenty or something different different interesting things like this some of them some of them may be found you know to be spurious eventually but there there are a number of them and they're in different fields of cosmology so it, it seems like there is something strange going on um, some people have said well maybe there are just a tremendous number of universes right. And so if there are, you know, 10 to the 500th power universes or whatever, then some of them are going to have life in them. And of course, we're the one that has life in it. And so, you know, once, once you admit these 10 to the 500th power other universes, there's no problem. And you say, oh, if, if that's all it needs. Uh, but there are, there are some speculative but, but plausible empirical theories which would predict there being uh, a tremendous number of other universes. Uh, the most plausible one would be inflationary cosmology. Um, but these, these typically, while they can solve the problem of the, the supposed fine-tuning of the constants, introduce some probabilities elsewhere. Uh, and so uh, they, they may well be true, but uh, Roger Penrose uh, says that uh, inflationary cosmology as a means of explaining away the specialness of our universe is worse than useless. Uh, furthermore, a large part of the reason that physicists take these models seriously is that they're hoped to provide sort of an intelligible mathematical unity to physics. Um, and it's not entirely clear. I mean, physics so far has been an uncovering of order and intelligibility and so on. Uh, the the uh, first scientists were people who thought that they were discovering the order with which God had made the universe. Um, it's not clear that we would expect this sort of intelligibility uh, on, on naturalism if these laws are things that just sort of happened. Uh, Eugene Wigner says that the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Uh, I don't know, maybe we don't deserve it, but theism does give us a way of understanding that. Um, and so it seems that these, these aspects of the universe cohere better with uh, theism than with a materialistic view. Uh, and so the world is strikingly intelligible in third person scientific terms. Uh, there is at least one aspect of the world that seems like it might, in principle, not be explicable in these terms, and that's, that's not a strike against intelligibility. Just saying it's a different sort of thing. Uh, and this, this, would be, this would be consciousness. Uh, there have been a lot of valiant attempts made to, 
to uh, reduce consciousness to statements about uh, fermions and bosons like we did with the table. Uh, but that, that seems, that might work for some things, but for some things it seems like that's gonna be really hard when you talk about uh, the enduring self or uh, the intentionality of thoughts, the aboutness of thoughts, or uh, phenomenal experiences, raw fields. Uh, and this is this is given this has caused some people to to give up on the reductionist picture. Um, Jay Guan Kim, who used to be a materialist and who's a very famous philosopher of mine, says in his book, "Physicalism, or something near enough, that it is not the case that all the phenomena of the world are physical phenomena, nor is it the case that physical facts imply all the facts." Uh, and he, he sort of writes off what, what the only thing he thinks isn't reducible is, is the subjective experience, the raw fields. And he sort of writes that off as mental residue. But that does, if, if you're going to allow anything not to reduce, that does seem to pose a problem for the coherence of physicalism as a whole because all of these things are integrated. Uh, the physical is supposed to be causally closed, so things that don't reduce, and, which is to say that all of the particles making you up are supposed to be predictable by you know, the basic laws of nature. Uh, but if that's true, then there's no reason for anything that doesn't reduce for irreducible mental states. They can't cause anything, yet they do seem to cause things because, like, I'm talking to you about them, so it seems like they cause behavior. Uh, so if these things don't reduce, it seems like you either have to admit mental causation, which is a problem for a physicalist, or else... Uh, sort of just say that it's a coincidence and you have something that looks a lot like Leibniz's pre-established harmony. And that seems like a problem. Um, these, these concerns have led some people to just sort of reduce everything that seems like it can be reduced. And other things you say that, well, you know, whatever. They, it, it, it's, it's not what we think it is. Uh, uh, Daniel Dennett is big on this. Um, and they say that what they're doing is preserving our actual experience and just rejecting a philosophical account of it. But then um, they say things like this from Susan Blackmore. Uh, I long ago concluded that there is no substantial or persistent self to be found in experience, let alone in the brain. I have become quite uncertain as to whether there really is anything it is like to be me. And you say, okay, that doesn't seem like it's, it's saving the appearances and so there are reasons to think that, that our experience of consciousness is much more at home in a theistic world than in a, a materialistic reductionist one. 